get better. There isn't any of us that can't get better. So turn on this whole idea of personal development and personal growth. That was what my teacher shared with me that changed my life. Starting a few steps from here at that convention. I'm telling you, for things to get better, you got to get better. Don't ask for it to change out there. Ask for you to change here. Don't ask for a more favorable wind. We call that naive. Don't ask for better seed, better soil. This is the only planet you got. Just ask that you can get wiser and stronger and better. And be able to take care of your own responsibilities. Get better. Learn how to handle the seasons better. Let's go through them. Just get better at handling the winters. You can't change the winter. You can't change the seasons. But you can change yourself. You say, well, what can I do about the upcoming winters of my life? The challenges that I know I'm going to face. Here's what you can do. You can get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, and better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came with. Next, get stronger. You can develop the muscle. You can develop the courage muscle. You can develop the inspiration muscle. You can develop the dedication muscle. You can get stronger. There isn't anybody here that can't get stronger. Next time we see you, may not even recognize you. How strong you're going to be able to become in language, in style, in personality, the ability to cope, the ability to handle with anything that happens, no matter what happens. And the third one is get better. We can all get better. I've gotten better. First talk I gave, I stood up, my mind sat back down. But here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. I stood up and I did it again. And I did it again and I did it again all those many years ago. I did it when I was scared and I did it when I didn't want to and I did it when I was ill. And I did it when it didn't work well and I didn't did it when they didn't appreciate it. And I didn't a lot of times when I didn't know much what I was doing. I just did it anyway. And now all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage but the greatest introduction I've ever had, greatest response and welcome I've ever had, the greatest opportunity I've ever had to touch this many lives with a mixture of words and heart and soul, I got better. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month. And I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach, until you can develop influence that won't quit. Touch people next year you couldn't touch this year. Touch people now you couldn't touch before. Conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before. Heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there, was missing before. I'm asking all of you to get better in spite of the winters, in spite of the downturn. The money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, whatever it is. Just get stronger. Get better. The key is not to wish for a better winter. The key is to wish for more strength, more wisdom, more courage. Get better, get wiser, get stronger. Here's number two. Learn to take advantage of the spring. Spring means opportunity. And we've got a fresh spring going here. It's called a spring like no other. A spring, an opportunity like no other for you. But here's the clue. Spring is not a guarantee of a harvest in the fall, in the autumn, harvest time. Here's what you must learn to do. Underline the two words if you're taking notes. Take advantage. Take advantage of the spring. Don't just be faked out by the spring because the nice weather has come. Looks like everything is going to be a lot better. The winter's finally passed. The spring is here. I'm telling you, that's not going to do it for you. Just because the spring is here, it's not going to do it for you. You got to seize it with your own two hands and take advantage. Read the books. Study the tapes. Go back through your notes. Get ready to cash in on the spring. And now there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why. Spring doesn't last that long. Let's take advantage of it. It's called take advantage of the spring. And there's also an urgency here. How many springs have you got in a lifetime? Not very many. Life is brief at the longest. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short. But it is short. There's an urgency here. Don't waste your springs. Don't just let them pass, 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 hoping the time will pass. 
take advantage. Last year it was seize the moment. And I'm asking you now this season to seize the spring opportunity. You've got a new organization going, seize the spring. You've got a new distributor going, seize the spring. You've got a new life situation going, seize the spring. Take advantage of it. Don't let it pass without giving it the best of your two hands and your attention. Number three, first, learn how to handle the winter. Second, take advantage of the spring. Number three, in the summer, learn to nourish and protect. We've got some major challenges now come summertime. One is to nourish our values, take care of them, feed them. Don't let them go hungry. Don't let them go wanting in nourishment and care. And then here's something else we've got to do in the summer. Defend ourselves against the enemies. Summertime is a unique time. It's a time of opportunity. It's also a time of challenge. But whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility, but don't take anything off anybody. Somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk, negative thinking, putting it all down, I'm telling you. Walk away if you have to. Walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever threatens your opportunity, threaten it back. Now, some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. Let me give you a quick list. Indifference. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. Boy, it's easy to coast. Especially if you've accomplished something, you know, extraordinary now. Somebody says, i got to relax. Here's the key. Not too long. The weeds will take all you plant if you rest too long. Don't rest too long. Indecision. you got to make those decisions. The ones that don't turn out to be good gives you experience to make better decisions. Don't let much time go by without making some decisions. The ones that you can make quickly, make them quickly. The ones that take time, take your time, but get those decisions made. Don't let indecision be an enemy, rob you of the future, empty your bank account, leave you with zero in the purse. Don't let that happen. The next one is doubt. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. People doubt that America's going to make it. People doubt that Europe's going to make it. People doubt that Russia's going to make it, that Poland's going to make it, that Czechoslovakia's going to make it. They doubt the whole world is going to make it. But I'm asking you not to pick up all those doubts. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, believe, drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog, drive you into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. And here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago, help take something around the world, so can you. If I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy raised in obscurity, so can you. If the millionaire team can do it, president's team can do it, walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. We haven't sold you short. That's why Mark, Larry, and Dr. Kassel and I have decided to invest a big share of our life these four days in being with all of you. If we didn't think you were worth it, we wouldn't have showed up. We don't need to conduct another meeting. We don't need to walk on another stage. We don't need to get up early like we get up. Don't need it. Except for the challenge and the opportunity to invest in this many people's lives, who wouldn't get up early? To have a chance to work miracles and invest in this many people's lives and help turn the world upside down for better nutrition called herbal life. To a lot of people, ambition is kind of a mystery. The dictionary says it's an eager desire for distinction, power, or fame. But what does that really mean? Well, let's start with the word eager. All by itself, eager is kind of exciting. Kids are eager for their birthday parties. They expect to be the center of attention, get lots of presents, eat too much. I guess grown-ups are eager for birthdays too. Unless, of course, they're embarrassed that the number of candles on the cake outnumber their achievements. 
But we can be eager to see a ball game, eager to see our kids in a dance recital, eager to see an old friend, eager to shop for a new car. Eager sounds like a lot of fun. But do you ever hear people say they are eager to live a better life, eager to have a better family, eager to make a lot of money? Probably not. And that's a problem. Because how I see it, living a better life, having a better family, and making a lot of money takes an eager desire. We have the remarkable ability to get exactly what we must have. But there is a difference between wishes and desires. We've all heard people say, Oh, I wish I could just drop five pounds. I want to be a little lighter. And we've probably said it ourselves especially after a big holiday dinner of turkey and homemade pie and every other thing we can possibly stuff ourselves with in one eight-hour period of time. And even though we may wish we could breathe a little easier in our clothing, we have to have the desire to exercise a little more and eat a little less. The I wish I could lose weight has to become I have the eager desire to lose weight. I'm also sure you've heard people talk about wishing they had more money to pay the bills or take a vacation or just to take a little pressure off of life. But before their lifestyle can change, their wish needs to become a desire. If they really desired change, they wouldn't spend their evenings just watching TV and wishing they were doing something more. The backbone of an eager desire to change is discipline. True ambition is disciplined, eager desire. It's that little part within us that says, if I want to be ready for that meeting tomorrow, I need to finish preparing for it today. If I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's college education, I need to start saving today. If I want a better life tomorrow, I need to start working on it today. Ambition is a minute-by-minute, day-by-day mentality. To have the ambition to work towards a better family life, a newer car, a bigger house, a financially secure future, you have to live it every moment. If living a successful life was easy, I'm sure more people would be successful. If just being ambitious was enough, I'm sure all of the broke and perplexed people in the world wouldn't be broke and perplexed. While most people spend most of their lives struggling to earn a living, a much smaller number seem to have everything going their way. Instead of just earning a living, the smaller group is busily working at building and enjoying a fortune. Everything just seems to work out for them. And here sits the much larger group, wondering in awe on how life can be so unfair, complicated, and unjust. So what's the major difference between the little group with so much and the larger group with so little? Despite all the factors that affect our lives, like the kind of parents we have, the schools we attended, the part of the country we grew up in, none has as much potential power for doing good as the ability to dream. Dreams are a projection of the kind of life we want to lead. Dreams can drive you. Dreams can make you skip over obstacles. When we allow our dreams to pull us, they unleash a creative force that can overpower everything in our way. To unleash this power, though, your dreams must be well-defined. A fuzzy future has little pull power. Well-defined dreams are not fuzzy. Wishes are fuzzy. To really achieve your dreams, to really have your future plans pull you, your dreams must be vivid. One of the issues Mr. James dealt with in his lifetime was, what does it mean to be a success, a significant person? After years of pondering this question, William James described success as a combination of two things. Number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. And number two, outer achievement related to that ideal. Let's go back to number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. 
I take that to mean defining a goal and having the resolve to complete it. No matter what, I'll do it or die. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. Go to the seminars until you get a handle on it. Do it until it makes sense. Practice it until you've got it right. Don't give up until you get where you want to be, however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, seminar by seminar, do it until. Go for it. Until is a very important word. It's magic. It means that you'll never give up. Don't miss the chance to grow, to pay the price. Until you learn, change, grow. You'll discover some of life's great treasures when you pay that price. William James' second part to success dealt with the outer achievement related to that ideal. You need both aspects to really be a success. But what Dr. James realized about his philosophy of success was that the first part is indeed more important than the second. Going for it. As long as you're working toward your inner goal, your dream, then success is possible. But once you give up your inner vision, then you can never become successful. You never will become successful. Until doesn't even matter. Now, maybe the person who's been working on a project for 10 years can be successful in his own right. If he's honestly working toward it, doing everything to make himself worthy of reaching the dream, really happy with where he is, doing it until, then maybe he is a success. It's a personal thing, going for it one step at a time. Going for small accomplishments along the way for however long it takes. So let's think about this for a moment. What outside evidence or results or proof can be seen when you accomplish your goals one step at a time? You'll start to see things change around you. Little things, not major things, but little everyday things. Things you may not even notice unless you are paying attention. If you're one of those who'd rather stay up late and get up late only to discover that your workplace doesn't fit your schedule and you roll out of bed cursing the alarm clock every morning, maybe you could start with the little change of going to bed half an hour earlier than normal. And maybe you'll see, in time of course, you can't train your body overnight, maybe you'll find out that you jump out of bed in a better mood and that your day will start better and that you'll get more done, and that the people around you that caused you problems aren't so hard to work with after all. It all starts by making one little change and adding to it every day. You see, you can't change what's going on around you without first changing what's going on within you. Start changing how you look at mornings, and sure enough, people will start changing how they look at you. When you start changing how you think, how you act, how you treat others, how you treat yourself, when you start responding instead of reacting to life, life will start responding to you. I'm telling you that you can do it with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. You cannot believe what can happen in such a short period of time. So you ask yourself, what small changes can I start making today? Well, you can start in your car on your way to work. If you're sitting on the highway, stop and go traffic, moving at about 15 miles per hour tops, look at the guy or the lady sitting next to you and give them a smile, or thumbs up, or even wave. Now, some people might think you're a little strange, but hey, you'll feel better. And tomorrow, when you get into the office, how about a big cheery hello to the people at the front desk and everyone you see on the way to your office? And when you get home tonight, how about giving your wife or husband and kids big hugs instead of collapsing on the sofa? When you start with the little things that make others happy, improve their day, you'll find that these little things add up to big ones. 
So what happens when you start taking charge of your own personal happiness, your own life? Do you think that these little things will somehow make a difference in meeting your goals? You bet they will. You can't do it alone. You can't be successful by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit, you know. The ambitious person realizes that each of us needs all of us. You all by yourself may have finalized the company's marketing plan or finished up the sales projections or even wrote the mission statement for the year to come. Even if you did this all by yourself, you really had the help of all of those around you who tolerated and supported your need to be undisturbed or provided service to you during the project. Maybe you should thank those people every once in a while with a dinner certificate or a bouquet of flowers. After all, without your support team, you probably wouldn't be where you are today. You can't be successful by yourself. So thank them. Thank those around you. And let them know just how important they are to you. Be it your office personnel or your family or your friends, a thank you sure goes a long way. You don't have to worry about the winds that will most certainly blow around you, the obstacles, the negativity that will stand in your way. You don't have to worry about what other people will say. You just have to keep your mind on your course. Those winds may blow fast and furious, but if you know your path, if you know where you are going, they will help push you toward the dreams and goals and treasures that you have already decided you're going after. Your goals will push you forward ahead of the stormy weather. There are some amazing people around that we can learn from today. People who have already braved the storms and come out on top. People who are still alive today. People who started with nothing and ended up with something great. Famous people, not so famous people. Maybe even people you know but don't know their stories. People who had an early vision and ambition. People who turned their focused dreams into the reality of success. One of my friends tells this story about her dad. She thinks he's cheap. She gives him a hard time every time they go to one of those all-you-can-eat places because he eats all he can eat until he can't move, until he needs to take something for indigestion. But she knows where he came from, his history, and understands just why he is the way he is. He eats all he can eat because he was raised in an orphanage, a place where you had to grab all you could or you'd be hungry. But the real story behind her father is that he made himself a millionaire with nothing more than a dream. He watched his own father drown when he was four was taken away from his mother a few years later and put into an orphanage because he was so bad. Raised by other people, strangers. After growing up in foster homes, he decided to go out on his own. He barely finished high school, but he found a job as a vacuum cleaner salesman. He did well, really well. But the woman he loved didn't want to marry a vacuum cleaner salesman. And he really didn't want to be one, so he went to college, went on to medical school, prospered, really prospered, led a tremendously successful life as a radiologist, and is now retired, goes fishing, rides his Harley. Stories of success are all around us, everywhere. Take the time to talk to these people or read their stories. You might learn something. You might find out that they have already traveled the path you are now on. Many of these people have written books on their journeys. These books tell the stories and give the secrets that we can all learn from. Let's say you decided to take a trip, just a short one, maybe for a weekend. Let's say you want to go away to a place you've never been before. Wouldn't you want to find someone who had been there, ask them a few questions? What's the best way to get there, the safest route, the quickest route? What do I need to bring to be totally prepared? What fun things should I look for on the way? What dangers do I need to avoid? 
by talking with someone who has already been there, it'll make your trip that much more enjoyable. It's the same thing with life. By listening to those who are farther along in the journey, the journey you are interested in taking, and learning from their successes and failures, you just might pick up something that will make your journey that much better. Listening to the stories of others can be motivating, captivating. They can provide that extra push you've been looking for. They can demonstrate what the power of ambition is truly all about. They've been there. Their knowledge is valuable. And when you use that knowledge and motivation to take action, you'll gain momentum. Eventually, you will find that the key to motivation, true motivation, is right there inside you. You won't have to look elsewhere to get pumped up, turned on, charged up. With the right knowledge behind you, you will learn how to motivate yourself. With the right knowledge, you will find yourself becoming inspired on your own. And in order to move forward, you must be motivated, inspired, ambitious. You must have dreams and goals that create ambition, good ambition, positive ambition. Now, ambition does not mean being greedy. It does not mean being selfish. It does not mean getting ahead at the expense of others. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is not avarice and all-consuming desire for wealth. Ambition is not hoping you can win at the expense of others. Do you suppose Judas was ambitious? He ended up with 30 pieces of silver, a fortune in those days. Was Judas successful because he had all that money? No, Judas sold out. Was Judas happy when it was all over with? No, the money didn't make him happy. What he did to get the money certainly didn't make him happy. What Judas became in the pursuit of his fortune caused him to end his own life. What drove him was not ambition. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is an eager desire to achieve, an eager desire to get ahead in life, to do more for your family, to prosper in health, wealth, and relationships. Now, desire does not always translate into ambition. Desire is what you want for yourself. A bigger house, a better car, a fatter bank account, a better life. I desire to have these things. Ambition is how you get there. Desire is sometimes healthy. Desire is sometimes unhealthy. Desire might say, I want the tallest building in town. The destructive side of desire might urge you to tear all of the other buildings down. I guess that's one way to do it. You might get away with tearing down the first one and maybe the second one. But in your desire to tear them all down, sooner or later, some guy is going to be standing out in front of his building saying, I'm on to you. Get out of here. And pretty soon you're no longer known as a builder. You're known as a destroyer. Now the second way to have the tallest building in town is to see it, dream it and plan it, and put your team on it, work on it, go through all of the steps to get there, do it right, have the ambition to be the owner of the tallest building in town, and go through all of the right steps to get there. If you really want it, and have the skills to do it, and the patience to weather all of the storms, your ambition will lead you there. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Now, it takes time to bring value to the marketplace. However, we do not get paid for time. So we cross that out. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, right? And have them send your money. So that's not true. We don't get paid for time. We get paid for value brought to the marketplace. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of my talk to you today. Is it possible to become twice as valuable to the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes. Could you become three times as valuable as you might be right now to the marketplace and make three times as much money? 
in the same time? And the answer is yes. Five times? Ten times? Of course. America is unique. It's a ladder to climb. It starts down here, let's say, at $5 an hour, and it keeps going up. Top income last year, $80 million. The guy who runs Coca-Cola. Now, that's a heck of a ladder. That's why everybody wants to come here, right? The boat people are not headed for Vietnam. Uh, people haven't plotted and schemed for 50 years saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. Not true. Everybody wants to come to America. And the reason is because we've got the best wind ever blowing in our favor. We've got the best economic opportunity anybody's had in six and a half thousand years. And all you have to do is understand it and take advantage of it. Now, there's some key questions to ask here. Why would the marketplace pay someone only $5 an hour? Very simple answer. They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now, we must underline to the marketplace. This person might be a very valuable brother. Yes. Member of the family, valuable. Yes. Valuable member of the church, of course. Valuable citizen of the country, yes. Valuable in the sight of God, no doubt. We're all of equal value in the sight of God. But if you're not very valuable to the marketplace, you don't get much money. You say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, then you got to start your own country. You know, this one's been in process for 200 years, and this is the best we've been able to come up with so far. But here's the key. You don't have to stay here. Now, there was a big debate in Congress last year that this $5 was not enough, should be six, should be six, should be six. But we don't need legislation. Six is already on this ladder. The next step up. You know, if you work for McDonald's, they'll pay you $5 an hour to take out the trash. If you whistle while you take out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. So we don't need that legislation. You need, just need to take lessons on how to whistle. Have a good attitude. Now, as you begin to climb this ladder, why would the marketplace pay some people $50 an hour? Answer, evidently, they must be more valuable to the marketplace. Ten times more valuable. And is that possible for someone to be 10 times more valuable and earn $50 an hour instead of five? And the answer is yes. That's what America is all about. Now, why would the marketplace pay some people $500 an hour? Evidently, this person must be much more valuable to the marketplace. That's what's important to understand to the marketplace. And would the marketplace pay one person $80 million for one year's work? And the answer is, of course. If you helped a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you $80 million? I'm telling you, it is possible. And that's why America is so exciting. That's why this financial ladder is so exciting. It's possible for all of this to come true for all of you, no matter where you start. As a student in school, just getting started out there in the workplace, this is all possible for you. Now, Mr. Schoff gave me the clue on how to climb this ladder as high as I wanted to climb. Now, we're talking primarily economics here. There's a lot of other ways to become valuable to your family, valuable to your friends, valuable to the community, valuable to the team, right? Valuable to the, to the uh, team effort, valuable to the concert. But here's what he said to me. In climbing this ladder economically, all you have to do is work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I heard that, it made sense to me. I kept hoping that everything else would change around me, found out that if I went to work on myself, worked on my skills, worked on my language, if I became better than I was each year, if I grew in skills and language and vocabulary, and competence, then I would become attractive to the marketplace. Not very long ago, a company called me and said, Mr. Owen, we're expanding internationally. We'd like to have a bit of your expertise to help us. Uh, would you give us a bit of your time? We'll add some millions to your fortune. And I said, okay. And I thought later, isn't that interesting? They would call me. Then my second thought was, of course they'd call me. Who else would they call? I can get the job done. Now, what a contrast for me, farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity, parents of modest means, broke when I was 25. How come I would get a telephone call and someone offer me 
a lot of money to help them in expanding around the world? Simple answer, evidently. Something happened to me between age 25 and where I am today. And I can tell you where it all started. From my teacher, Mr. Schoff, who said to me, we don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. And now there's several ways to do that on personal development. And let me give you those ways. Here's the first one. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Learn from your personal experience. Mr. Schof asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Now here's number two, why I came to share this video experience with you today. And that I call it OPE, other people's experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher, other people. That's your friends and colleagues, other people. The people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences, what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them, how they changed their health and changed their bank account and changed their income and changed their future. That's it, other people. Now there's two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. It's too bad failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Bring your notebook, have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all away, threw their health away and threw their friendships away and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health and so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills, so we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They've got the income, so we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now here's what's important in personal development. In learning from other people, we learn number one, by observation. We learn what we see, we watch, people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines by observation, what we can see. The reason I created this video is something that you could see someone's experiences translated for you. Second, we learn by what we hear. I've got some of my uh, lectures on cassette tape, so you know, you can take them with you wherever you go and learn by listening. Turn your car into a mobile classroom and listen. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then number three is vitally important on personal development. And that is read all the books. All the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Schof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. Haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it my library. At least I was smart enough to buy it. Now I got to be smart enough to read it. And then of course I got to be smart enough to decide what's valuable and then do it. But this one is very important. Become a good reader. Some books that helped change my life. Mr. Schoff recommended of course the Bible. And my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. That's been so beneficial for me drawing from those illustrations. Uh, reading about those stories, people who made it and people who didn't make it and what the difference was. And then other books that helped to really change my life. One called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then a book that helped me become financially independent by the time I was 31. And that book is called The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. And I'm going to share a little bit of that book with you when I get to financial independence today, our third subject. But I started reading the books, attending the classes, uh, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. 
Now, at first I took, you know, notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes. And it didn't serve me well, you know, thrown in a drawer. Then I learned to keep a journal, a bound copy of all my notes. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Uh, when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. Uh, you read something in a magazine, right? Some ideas, take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well. My journals make up a significant portion of my own library. And if you saw my library and saw my journals, I'd tell you what you'd have to say. This is the library and these are the journals of a very serious student. No wonder Mr. Rohn is invited to lecture and speak on his experiences around the world. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later, go back over it and review it and let it become valuable to you. So that's my first subject, personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, uh, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change, personal development. And let me say it one more time, if you will change, everything will change for you. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing. As you look back on a few months, look back on a few years, you won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, and whether you're in sports or economics or whatever, I'm 